You know, it's not a good thing when you get so enthralled with your own title bumper that you forget you need to put yourself on the screen or nobody's going to know what you're doing. <laughs> I just amuse myself immensely sometimes. Anyway, hi, everybody. This is another edition of Women in Business. It is Wednesday, June 1st at 3 o'clock p.m., and we all know what that means. I am so glad you're here today because we have an amazing guest with us, and I'm so excited to talk to her. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time just going on about whatever's in my head. I'd rather talk to her. But let me tell you who she is first. Christy Bertram is the Director of Education and Training for Bernina of America. During her first job as a cashier at Bernina of Oklahoma City, she fell in love with the sewing community and has made it her career ever since. Christy loves sewing, garments, and quilts, but embroidering is her passion. She has taught machine embroidery workshops across the United States and has trained other industry professionals in embroidery for the last 20 years. So we got some serious embroidery experience here, people. A born and raised Oklahoman, Christy is a transplant to the Chicago area where she enjoys family adventures with her husband and two kids. Let's bring her in. Thank you for being here with me, Christy. I'm so excited to have you here. You have no idea. <laughs> Thanks so much. I'm, I'm delighted to be here as well. Oh, well, there's so much I want to talk to you about, but the first thing that I want to start with is something we talked about a little bit before we started this today, which is the fact that embroidery is a female-dominated industry. And I want to talk about that because part of your brief or your mission at Bernina is education. So is that education mostly in how to do things with your machine or do you also talk about starting a business or how you can have a business and all that kind of stuff? You know, it's really all of the above. Um, we okay. do uh, teach customers how to use their machine. And a lot of our customers use their machine for their hobby and not for a business. And that's wonderful. We support that and we love that. Um, but we, of course, also a lot of people who purchase a machine are looking to start a business. Um, we do a little bit of that sort of training. Most of that is going to come at the dealer level. We sell our mm -hmm. machines through the local dealer. And um, there's a lot of support there at the local dealership. Um, and, uh, you know, learning how to to get started. And of course, a lot of what people learn on how to run the business is by connecting with each other. And um, that's one thing that the local dealers are so good at. And that is helping people connect to other people who do what they do. Well, I think like from your bio, you started at uh, Bernina in Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how that's kind of the gateway drug for a lot of people getting into this, they wander into a shop or they see something that somebody made and they say, oh, I want to go, I want to try this, I want to learn more about it. And mm -hmm. then they meet other women who are already doing it and they get involved in it too. So is that how it worked for you or did you have a background before? Um, I personally didn't have a background in sewing before I started working at the shop, um, but my mom did. She was a tailor. And okay. um, so I was around sewing a lot. And, you know, she had her own business doing tailoring um, and which is also, you know, a really empowering business, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was around sewing a lot. And that's how I got introduced to the shop and started working there, really not with the intention to learn to sew. Um, I was just going to do the cashier, be the cashier and answer the phone and like everybody else going to do the sewing stuff. But you know, you're around it and then you just can't help but fall in love with it. And that's what happened for me. So, Right. Well, I love that, that I had no intention to sew. Yeah, I was just exactly. there to answer the phones and run the cash register. And then you kind of get sucked into it a little bit is I think what happens. But what I love is like what you said about your mom and the fact that this traditional craft of tailoring and sewing and embroidering and all this stuff has become this kind of 
empowering thing for a lot of women. I mean, if you do it for a craft, you're, you're expressing your artistic ability. If you do it for a business, it's a way to earn money and be mm -hmm. independent. And I guess the, where I'm going with all this, and you're probably wondering is, um, what did what led you to decide that you wanted to be an educator in this? Did you look at this as I want to teach people how to make beautiful things? Or first of all, did you always want to be an educator? Or is that something that you kind of found, I guess is the word I want to say. You know, it's interesting you say that. So I, um, while I was working at the shop, I did get a degree in education with the intention of teaching elementary school. Um, okay. But I never did end up teaching elementary school. And, you know, it's kind of funny because you do your student teaching at the end of your degree. Mm -hmm. And if I had done my student teaching at the beginning of my degree, I would have had a different degree. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but I did get an education degree, which has served me well, um, you know, and then I went, but went back later and got a business degree. But um, it served me well in that teaching adults is not mm -hmm. that different from teaching children. And so I learned some techniques that helped me. But in terms of learning to, in terms of wanting to teach um, and be, and being involved in education at the, in the sewing industry, I kind of fell into it. Um, there was a new, at the time I was teaching or the time I was working at the shop, there was a brand new embroidery software and a brand new embroidery machine. And it was maybe a little bit intimidating to the other people in the shop who hadn't been you know, that familiar sure. with technology and I was not afraid of it. So I just jumped mm -hmm. in and learned it. And because I learned it first, then I had to teach it. And um, then you'd get started teaching and you see how good it feels to help somebody mm -hmm. learn something new and to help them, you know, take this thing that they weren't sure they were going to be able to do, or maybe they were feeling a little um, uncertain about their purchase. And then suddenly now they feel so confident and ready to really tackle, um, their sewing or their embroidery. So um, yeah, it, it wasn't really my intention to go that direction, but once I got started, um, it really was my passion. And I know from uh, something somebody said in a podcast or something that I read that you worked for a couple different places before mm -hmm. you found Bernina. So mm -hmm. you haven't always been with Bernina, but how do you, I, I guess the next question I have to ask is, you're the what I want to get this right, the director of education and training. So how does one go about developing an education and training program? for? <laughs> I mean, that's got to be enormous. How do you figure out? This is just my curiosity. But yeah. how do you figure out what yeah. you're going to offer? I mean, because yeah. you got, I, I looked at your list and I'm going to just put up here real quick. Anybody who wants to go see their education offerings, you can find them here. But how do you decide what goes on your educational menu and what doesn't? I'm just curious for myself. I want to know. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, we do two different types of education and that's both dealer training. So training the independent store right. owners um, on how to sell the product and use the product. And then we also train the end user um, who is either, you know, a small business or a hobbyist. And so we train both. Um, right. And, you know, coming up with the program to, to train and develop, deliver all this education really is a big project. But I'm really, really lucky that, you know, I've, I've known three people who had this position prior to me that I've had the opportunity to actually know. Oh, and cool. yeah, I mean, how often do you get to have a job where you know the people who've done it before you and to see what a great legacy that they left mm -hmm. and, you know, was able to learn a lot from what they did and how they structured their education. Um, but then of course we have a great team. We have about 20 people who are full-time um, in our education department. And so so we really work together and, um, you know, come up with a plan and we have different people for different segments. So we have people who are focused on quilting. We have people who are focused on surging. Um, we have people who are focused on embroidery. And so each of those people are able to kind of focus in on their area, 
find out what the needs are and then bring them to the table and we can put together a plan together. Um, another really big part of how we develop our plan is by spending time talking to those independent dealers mm -hmm. um, because they're the ones who really know, um, you know, what they need in terms of training, but also what their customers are asking for. And, you know, what are the, what are the gaps in terms of what do people struggle with, with their machine and, and help us to put together programs that support that. So um, it's a, definitely a big team effort. We, we, <laughs> we put a lot of uh, time in planning. We do uh, a lot of strategic planning uh, in our department before we actually launch anything. So. Well, I have to confess it, the, a little bit of curiosity in that question was that I'm contemplating doing something similar, mm -hmm. an education program for the trade show that mm -hmm. I'm part of. And I'm just like, how do you do that? Because yeah. I know every time I ask the question, like, what would you like to see? Or what interests you? I get 50 million different answers. Mm -hmm. so, yes. Yeah, I exactly. Mean, but I like that you talk about that you work with the network of independent dealers, mm -hmm. because you're right, that's like amazing feedback that you can yes. get from them about what people are doing in the field. And mm -hmm. I just, I don't know. I love the whole idea of this network of independent dealers that are all working together and supporting each other. And, and I also think that embroidery stores and quilt shops and all that kind of stuff have been such a fertile ground for women who want to start businesses. Yeah, so, absolutely. And I yeah. think that's amazing. But I do have another question for you. And again, this is a my curiosity question, but, and I realize this might be like picking your favorite child, but <laughs> what do you, what, what of the disciplines do you like doing the most? Is it embroidery? Is it quilting? Is it sewing? Um, so for me, I do all kinds of sewing personally, but uh, my I have two favorites. One is quilting. I do really like to quilt and I make a lot of quilts for my personal use. Um, but also I really love embroidery. That is um, really where I spent a lot of my career was focused mm -hmm. on embroidery and I love doing it. There, you can embroider anything. And I always say about embroidery, you know, it's the fun part and, mm -hmm. um, you know, making the shirt or whatever that you're going to put the embroidery on is like the part you have to get through so that you can do the embroidery. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's the fun part. Um, but you know, with embroidery, you also can cheat a little bit because you can start with something that's pre-made. You can start mm -hmm. with a bag or a pair of jeans or someone brings you their jacket and you can add embroidery to it and, you know, really personalize something that already exists. And so you can get to the fun part faster. So that's my right. personal. There you go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, I think that's true, but I want to I want to focus on I want to talk about something that you talked about in another podcast you did because I loved it so much. I knew immediately when I heard it. I said we got to talk about this. And that's this whole phenomenon of what you call curvy sewing, mm -hmm. which first of all the name just kills me. I love it. But it's the idea that you sew garments for the body that you have, and if that body is more curvy, or bigger, or whatever you want to call it, that's what you sew the garments for. And there's a picture of you somewhere, and I wish I thought to pull it and so I could share it now, but you have this gorgeous black dress on, which you did with this kind of silver, I don't know what I want to call it, lace, garnish, mm -hmm. border, whatever it is, that's it's kind of a wrap dress sort of thing, and yeah. it's just gorgeous. Well, thank and you. <laughs> you're <laughs> welcome. But I want to talk about this because I think there's a lot of bits about this I want to talk about, but I want to start with where did curvy sewing come from? Where, what gave you the idea that this is something that you wanted to promote or embark on? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I do sew for myself and I am a plus size person. And so that's, that's part of it. Um, but I've been all different sizes, you know, in my life, I haven't mm -hmm. always been, you know, I've been thinner, I've been bigger, it's, you know, it, and a lot of us have been in that situation. Yep. And as a sewer, I, you know, I used to really hesitate to make clothes for myself, because I was always kind of waiting to be in a body that I felt like deserved making mm -hmm. clothes for. And finally, I got to the idea that I was like, I'm, I'm not, I need to treat myself with the same respect I would treat anyone else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, I, I hearken back to the days when my mom was a tailor and part of what made her business so successful was that she could make something that fit 
anyone, you know, mm -hmm. whatever size, whether you're tall, small, big, whatever it was, she could make it fit you and you felt good in it. And, you know, I was like, I deserve clothes that I fit me and I feel good in. And, you know, when it comes to buying plus size clothes and, you know, for whether you're curvy or not curvy, it's hard to find things that for me suit my tastes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, of uh, plus size clothes out there, but if it's not what I want to wear, if it's not something that I feel good in, um, you know, then it, it erodes away at my confidence. And so being able mm -hmm. to sew something for myself that I feel good in, that I'm confident in, that I love, that I picked the fabrics that I, you know, I, I was able to really construct something that I knew I was going to feel good in, you know, whether I'm happy with whatever shape I happen to be that day or not, I can feel good in what I'm wearing. Well, and I think one of the, there's so much in what you just said that I want to pull out, but I want to start with this. One of the things, because I'm a plus size too, I've dropped about 70 pounds in the past two years. And I have learned that wearing clothes that fit me better makes me look better and feel so much better. And a lot of the clothes that are out there for plus size people are I hate the term, but they're moo-moos, basically. It's like putting on a tent. It's like, how much fabric can we drape over you to disguise the fit? And what it ends up doing is making you look even bigger than you would if you wore clothes that fit you right. Well, and I think, you know, it's if you want to wear a garment that is that fits that way, sure. great, but we don't have to, we don't have right. to. And, you know, we don't have to be afraid of whatever shape we happen to be. We can embrace it, you know, at the moment. And, you know, it's sometimes we use the term body positivity sometimes, mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, I've had some people who've kind of given me some feedback that that maybe even body positivity isn't the right word because not everybody always feels positive about where they are with their body. Fair and enough. that's okay. It's more about like body acceptance. Like this is the body I'm in and I'm going to make clothes that fit and look good and that accept this body. And um, so I, I think that's really important because we, you know, don't need to be waiting for the right moment, you know, or waiting for the right mm -hmm. clothes or, um, you know, and it's, it is very empowering to have the skill to sew for yourself. While I would love to see more companies do a better job offering more clothes and more sizes. And I think we should continue to advocate for that. There is something about having that, that skill and that power to do it for yourself and not have to wait uh, for that to happen. So. Well, I think that's totally true. And again, there's so much in what you just said that I want to pull out. But I want to talk first about the whole idea of when you are a bigger sized person, you kind of, especially if you're a bigger sized woman, you're kind of told that, you know, when you get to whatever the acceptable size is, then you can have the pretty stuff. But, you know, and I think you're totally right in saying that whatever size you're in, whatever size you're at, you deserve to look the way you want to look. And if, exactly. you know, if you're more comfortable with more camouflage and you want to wear bigger things, do that. But if you're more comfortable with, you know, wearing stuff that's more form fitting, you should be able to do that. But Absolutely. I don't. I don't get the whole idea of how do I want to put this the right way? I'm, I'm trying to find the words to articulate what I want <laughs> to say, and it's not really working. This is a subject that is pretty close to my heart for a lot of reasons. But I guess what I want to say is where did that idea come from that you're only, well, okay, I know where the idea came from. It came from society. But how do we how do we get it in our heads, I guess, is what I want to say, that you're only acceptable if you're a size six. And if you're a size 16, you should, you know, be hiding in a corner somewhere. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Is that is that a cultural thing or? Yeah, I mean, I think, of course, there's so many influences out there, whether it's, you know, magazines or whatever, even just the social media you consume and that sort of thing that, you know, that give us those messages. But I think what's so beautiful about the world we live in today is with social media and, you know, I, I'm a big TikTok fan. I use a lot of TikTok, um, but other types of social media, we can connect to people who are like us 
and we can hear different messages, you know, instead of constantly being bombarded with, you know, you need to be on a diet and you need to be wearing these, you know, you, mm -hmm. you can get to this place somewhere. We can find other people who are saying like, you are worthy wherever you are today. And we can, we can fill ourselves with those messages, um, you know, and, and, uh, and I think we have that opportunity to choose um, that wasn't always there. You know, it yeah. wasn't always did we have the opportunity to connect, you know, to these other communities, other people who are similar to ourselves or in a similar situation to where we are. I do agree with that. I think that that is for all the people that argue that social media is awful and, you know, a cesspool or a toilet or whatever they want to call it. You know, if you curate who you're listening to and who you're seeing, you can find really good messages out there. And yeah. that's one of the reasons that we've talked about this sort of thing on this show of several times is because number one, it's something that I deal with, but there is still a lot of negative feedback going on out there that, mm -hmm. you know, you have to be a size two or a size four to be acceptable or beautiful or whatever it is. And I agree. I'm glad to see more people coming out and saying that, you know, it doesn't matter what your size is. You can be beautiful at any size. I love that. Yeah. I, I think totally it's totally true. It's great to but, see those messages. It really is. And I want to get back to another thing you said, but I want to a couple of comments here. We have the dreaded Facebook user who says, I love your no fear attitude. <laughs> I, I, I do too. I think that's great. And um, Cindy King says, what is funny is that sizing is ready made. I can wear an eight and I can wear an 18. Sizing is just a number. How it fits is the key. And you can cut out the tag with like yeah, eight absolutely. <laughs> A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And you know, when you sew for yourself, there's so much um, flexibility you have when it comes to sizing, because I'm quite a different size on top than I am on bottom. And mm -hmm. because I can sew for myself, that's not a problem. I can still make a dress that fits me. And for me to find a ready to wear dress that fits me next to impossible because I'm two different sizes. And so again, even, you know, not only am I not a certain size in one brand to another, I'm not the same size top and bottom. And that's okay, <laughs> because I can, I can make something that that fits me, um, whatever size I am. And, you know, the same is true, actually, with uh, patterns. Um, there isn't like a super consistent. Um, so when you go to start sewing for yourself, you'll find the same thing in terms of one pattern maker, their size is, you know, you fit a size 10 and another one you fit a size 14 um, because pattern makers, there's not a real super consistent size. Um, but if you know how to sew, you can read a measurements chart and all of the patterns have a measurements chart for you. So you can say like, oh, this is my waist size. So I can very easily figure out which pattern is going to fit me best based on my sizes. And you don't have that luxury with ready to wear. So quick question, since we're talking about patterns, and I think this came up in the other podcast you did, but I want to ask it too. What it, are there companies out there making plus size patterns or clothing that, you know, or do you just have to buy like, a, I don't know, a regular size pattern and extrapolate, I guess. Yeah, there are a lot of companies offering plus size patterns. Um, even what we call the, the, the big um, pattern companies, um, the McCall Simplicity, some of those brands that you've probably seen in, um, in, uh, uh, large fabric stores, mm -hmm. they do offer plus size. Um, not every, not every pattern is available plus size, but they do offer a really good selection of plus size patterns. But also there are a ton of independent pattern companies um, where you can buy the pattern online and you can print it yourself. Um, there are a ton of companies, some that specialize in plus size patterns and that's all they do. And, um, and then an increasing number of uh, pattern companies um, who used to only have what we call straight sizes now have mm -hmm. uh, plus sizes as well. So there really is a lot out there. Um, there's still always, if you really want it to fit great, you're probably going to do some altering to the pattern to make it fit you exactly. Um, because not not all plus size people are the same shape. Um, sure. So you're still going to make some changes to it. But there are really good starting places out there um, and lots of options. 
Okay, I got to ask because I don't know anything about this. How does one print out a pattern? Because the pattern would not be big enough, I would think. Yeah, yeah. There's a couple ways you can do it. One <laughs> is you print out the pieces and you tape them together. And that's how okay. a lot of people do it. They print out all the little eight and a half by 11s and they tape them I together. I say. Yeah, you can do it that way. And the, and the pattern companies do offer it um, in those, you know, pieces that you can tape together. Um, but they also will offer what we call a copy shop file. And so you can take it to a printer who has a large format printer mm -hmm. and have it printed for you. Um, so, and that's what I usually do because I really don't like taping all the pieces of paper together. Well, um, so, yeah. <laughs> so I usually send it to be printed and then I have, you know, it comes on a big roll um, and you cut it out from there. So that was I was just like trying to envision that and I was thinking, okay, I have my little, you know, HP printer downstairs. Yeah. If I tried to print out, how would that even work? Yeah, you tape it together. <laughs> and this is, Sheila is making me laugh because she says, this is all getting Christine so much closer to sewing. I can hear it in her voice. Not even a little bit. I just like <laughs> knowing stuff. I you mean, never know. You never know. Well, eventually at some point, just because of the number of people that I have met and know that do all this stuff. Yeah, probably something. Yeah. But I, it just makes me curious because I have to, I have to ask the questions. And uh, Cindy says, um, I do have to give a plug for my garment instructor, Angela with pattern. She designs for all sizes and you can draft to all your curves. So that's awesome. Yeah, I love it. But I want to also, I mean, now that you've satisfied my curiosity about the mechanics of it, I want to talk about the whole body acceptance thing, because I think this is something that more people, especially more women, need to kind of take on board, because mm -hmm. we are told in so many different ways that we're not acceptable if we're not a size four or a size six. You know, and I like the body acceptance because as someone who has struggled to accept my body for a lot of years and was told for a lot of years that it was not acceptable, I like the idea of just wherever you are in the moment, that's good. So is this a concept that you came up with or did you hear this from someone else or? Oh, I definitely heard it from someone else, not taking any credit for okay. that one. <laughs> Um, and you're starting to hear it more and more. I mm -hmm. hear it from, from social media creators. I've read a lot of fantastic books. There's a really good one. If you're interested in this subject, I would recommend called Body Kindness. Um, that's mm -hmm. just lovely. Um, and, you know, I've read a lot of those types of books. Um, and there's, you know, I could give you a whole list, but that's one I would say if, if you're really kind of thinking about that concept of body acceptance, that, that book Body Kindness is really fantastic. And the concept of you would be as, be as kind to yourself as you would be to, to mm -hmm. someone else. And, um, you know, there's, there's ways that we can, we can treat ourselves. So it's been about filling my mind with those kind of positive messages. Um, because, you know, for me in terms of kind of turning that corner, it was like, I'm just, I'm just tired. You know, I'm tired mm -hmm. of constantly chasing something um, that wasn't working for me. And, um, you know, it's like, I just want to be able to focus on my life and my work and my family. And, um, and so I, I chose, you know, to start looking for other messages. And, um, you know, there's, um, as you know, as someone who also loves books, um, there's always, mm -hmm. you know, um, some great authors out there who can inspire us in these ways. Definitely. But I think it's also important to talk about the idea that there's we always are told we should be striving for something else. And mm -hmm. I like what you said about I wanted to concentrate on other things, because mm -hmm. when you are obsessive about your size and getting smaller or doing, you know, it's like that's the only thing that you can think about almost. Mm -hmm. And it does cut into other areas of your life. Yeah. And I mean, if it's a, if it's a health issue and that you're carrying more weight than you should be, so it's making you unhealthy, then yeah, that's a little different scenario. But if it's just, I want to be smaller because then I'll be more socially acceptable, mm -hmm. you know, that's a little different thing. So there is a question in here, wait for it. It's coming. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm rambling a little bit, but like I said, this is a subject that is really 
near and dear to my heart. But I guess I want to ask you, how did you get to that place? Because I think there are a lot of people who struggle. I know I was one. There's a lot of people who struggle with this. Was it reading books like Body Kindness? Was it meeting people who had this or finding people on social Mm -hmm. media who had the same attitude? Or Mm -hmm. have you always kind of had this? You know, um, I no, I haven't always had it. I have definitely struggled with uh, with body image and um, have had a number of of issues related to that. Um, I had a book recommended to me by a therapist, actually, um, mm-hmm. and that was really where my journey started. And you know, it wasn't, it didn't start as a um, I want to, you know, give up on the idea of being thinner. It started on an, an idea of like, I have to get out of this mental head space. Right. Yes. And, um, and so that was, you know, at the time was working with a great therapist and, you know, just plug for anybody who's used a therapist before, or you currently mm-hmm. like use the tools that are out there for you. Oh, we're um, big on yeah. therapy. On, yeah. On <laughs> yeah. So, um, so it was a book recommended to me by a therapist um, and um, which led to, you know, you read in the back of the book, like for further reading, go to mm-hmm. this book. And then you just kind of start down uh, a rabbit hole and you find out there's this whole community out there. And um, so that's where it started for me was a book recommendation. And then from there you start finding people and you, you, um, you like a book that you read and you follow that person on Facebook or you uh, connect Mm -hmm. to them in some other way and you just start finding that community. Well, and I think part of the reason I like talking about this stuff is I wish when I had been a younger person that this kind of stuff had been available. Now, granted, when I was a teenager, the internet didn't exist yet, which should tell you a little bit about how old I am. (laughs) But, um, you know, so the messages weren't really there as Mm -hmm. much as they are now. But That's why I think it's so important that we have conversations like this and we talk about, you know, body neutrality or body Mm -hmm. acceptance or whatever it is. And the Mm -hmm. fact that your size shouldn't dictate whether you're a good or a bad person or, Mm -hmm. you know, whether you're acceptable or not, it should Mm -hmm. be the last thing anybody thinks about. And Mm -hmm. I don't know why it's still so important to so many people. So, like I said, obviously I have... (laughs) <laughs> I have yeah. some feelings about this topic. Yeah, well, it's a it's a topic that brings up a lot of feelings for sure. It does. But I like the whole I what I'd really like to see change, I have to say. And I think it's starting to. But the stuff that's taught to young women and the things that and I think this is where the whole body acceptance thing and sewing for your size and all that kind of stuff can really make a difference. Because if you can teach young people, especially young women, that it doesn't matter what their size is, they can still be attractive, they can still be pretty. And I just like that whole idea, I guess. That's what makes... Yeah, I just love I just love the idea of people having power in their own lives, right? Yes. And um and whether that's the power of being able to accept your body or the power of being able to sew for yourself, um you know, people having having their own agency and be able to um to choose their own path, I think is so important. And um yeah, I I think uh it's a really important topic. I definitely agree. I have another I'm just curious question because I am what was the first thing that you ever made for yourself? Um, oh, like the first garment I ever made for myself? Yeah, the first, the first piece of clothing that you ever made. What did I sew for myself first? Hmm. Or something that's memorable. Yeah, I think uh, the, probably the first thing that I really remember is a dress, you know, just a simple knit dress. Um, but being able to see a piece of fabric that I fell in love with and being like, oh, mm-hmm. I have to. I have to make that for myself. And um, so, yeah, that's, I can remember a dress that of a specific fabric that I really loved. And if it wasn't the first thing I made, it was one of the first things that I had made for myself. Um, you know, I've made, I made myself a, a number of things over, over time, but um, you know, for me, dresses in particular, because I am hard to fit was like, oh, being able to have a dress that actually fits, it was very exciting. Well, and I think there's something to be said, and I didn't really think about this until you just said that, but there's also something to be said for being able to pick the colors that you like and the fabric that you like, because that's one thing I notice with clothes I buy from, you know, 
mostly online, but from stores is that you can look at something and go, I really love that, but I wish it was blue. Yeah, Or exactly. I really like that, but I'd like it better if it was green or mm -hmm. if I had this really cool, you know, polka dot fabric or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, then, then, you know, that takes that sewing empowerment to another level because it's not just about something that fits and feels good, but it's about choices that you made and creative choices. Um, you know, getting dressed is a creative choice, whether you made it or not, um, but you have more options and more creativity available to you if you do so for yourself. I definitely agree with that. And I think it's, Cindy's making me laugh here. She says, do you mean we're not supposed to be the same size we were when we graduated <laughs> high school? Well, actually, I'm smaller, I think, than I was <laughs> when I graduated high school. So, But I love the whole concept of learning how to, and yeah, maybe I am getting, maybe you're being my gateway drug to decide <laughs> I want to sew something. Because I really like this concept of clothing the body that you're in and doing it in a way that works for you. Because I think there's so many, what's the word I want? Rules is the only word I can think of. And that doesn't feel right, but it kind of is, you know, if you're over 50, you're not supposed to wear this. And if you're, uh -huh. you know, certain colors aren't supposed to be worn in these times of year and all this right. kind of stuff. And if you're, if you have the power to just make your own stuff, then you can kind of do whatever wild or not wild thing yeah. you want to do. And I, okay, you're kind of converting me and it's scaring me. <laughs> well, I don't we know certainly if I'm ready for this. <laughs> we certainly can help you learn whenever you are ready. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you can. But that's another question that I have. And I want to circle around to this for a little while because I, when you set out to teach somebody how to embroider or sew mm -hmm. or quilt or what surge or whatever mm -hmm. it is, what's the first thing that you tell them? Not to be afraid. I think it's okay. The, that's it's a good one. Taking the fear out of it. You know, it was, um, just like when I learned computers and I'm old enough to remember before I had computers. Right. right. Um, but I was, you know, once I took the fear factor out of it, that I'm not going to break it, or even if I do break it, I can fix it. Um, you know, that really helps you relax and learn and, mm. and taking the fear factor out and knowing that, um, you know, especially if you have a good quality machine, you're not going to break it. You know, you're, you're, even if you break the needle, you can put a new needle mm -hmm. in, you're going to be okay. Um, and so for me, that's always, you know, that um, that's the first thing I want to do with, with my students is to make sure they're feeling comfortable, make sure that they're, you know, in a place where they know that it's safe, that it's okay if they make mistakes, you know, to just create an environment of safety. And mm -hmm. um, once we've created that environment of safety, then we can start really talking about, okay, here's the first step that you need to know about your machine and how you're going to use it, how you're going to learn how to sew. Um, but we can't do that until we've created an environment where everybody feels like, there's no dumb questions where they feel safe mm -hmm. um, and where they're not afraid of their equipment. Well, and that all, that leads me to another question, because this is something that I run into or I ran into when I used to work for a supplier, which is you get someone who spends all the money to get their fancy machine and they're all excited and then they get it home and they're terrified that they're going to make a mistake and they're mm -hmm. going to mess it up. So number one, do you run into that with people? And if you do, how do you get them over it? Because that's something I never quite figured out. So I always mm -hmm. like to ask other teachers, how yes. do you do it? Yes, absolutely. Um, it is, it, we run into it all the time that customers will buy something and then be a little bit afraid to try it or, um, you know, or maybe they have, um, we sell a lot of machines that are sewing and embroidery. And I find a lot of times customers are really comfortable with sewing because they've done that a lot, sure. but the embroidery part is scary to them. And they're, you know, they just don't know where to start. Um, so one thing that we do um, that helps is our independent dealer network, um, when they when a customer buys a machine, most of our dealers will actually take it out of the box with the customer at the store mm. before they ever take it home. Mm. 
and they sit, they sit the customer in front of the machine and they're like, okay, before you go home, we're going to spend 20 minutes just getting you oriented to it, you know? And, um, and so that's, you know, one thing to help make sure that even before you ever get at home, you've had a little bit. Um, but of course we also provide tons of resources online. So if you do get at home and you can't remember, there's lots of materials you can go look up. There's tutorials, there's videos. Um, there isn't anything you can't look up <laughs> and learn how yeah, to do it. No. <laughs> So there's there's so many videos, but getting that little bit of an orientation, um, you know, with somebody who knows the product and um, and, you know, having a relationship with that independent dealer. Um, mm -hmm. That's why I'm a big advocate. You know, if somebody if somebody's new to sewing um, a lot of times and it's understandable because that's where we all shop. A lot of times people will think I'm going to go to a big box store and I'm just going to buy one off the shelf because I'm not going to sew that much. And I, you know, I don't need all that fancy stuff. I just want something simple. But what happens is when you buy it there, you don't have that person to call. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm always advocating, like, just go to the shop and experience what it's like to buy something from someone who's going to support you and really take good care of you. Um, even if it means that you buy the cheapest thing at that store or you buy a used machine at that store, you know that you've got a relationship that's really going to help you. And it makes such a difference. Well, I would agree. And I think there's something I think that's a, it's kind of a sad thing that this is starting to go away a little bit, which is the dealers in your town that you mm -hmm. can walk in. Like we have a couple here where I mm -hmm. live in Traverse City and you can walk in and you can see examples of the stuff that's been made and mm -hmm. you can see the machines and you can talk to someone as yeah. opposed to. And I mean, I worked for, you know, in my former life, I was director of marketing for a company that was solely online. We didn't mm -hmm. have any other than at trade shows, but there's something for a dealer network. And mm -hmm. I, I hope that doesn't go away. Yeah. I hope that that sticks around because I think it's a, plus there's something to be said for having someone right there with you mm -hmm. that can, I mean, I, I'm not knocking any of the online educators. Absolutely. Though, yeah. <laughs> Cause they're Absolutely. amazing. And I've learned a lot of stuff from them, but there's something to be said for somebody that's right there that does it that you can see, but it, mm -hmm. it kind of, I'm trying to think how I want to put this the right, I'm, I'm having a lot of, I want to put this the right way, <laughs> but I do want, because it's something I want to bring up since I have you here, which is there's this whole kind of divide. And I don't know if it's divide is the word I want, but there, some people want to make there be a divide between people who are what we would just call crafters or people who are home sewers or whatever, prosumers or whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it, and people who work on the commercial side. Mm -hmm. And I think those lines are blurring and crossing a lot. And I wanted yeah. to kind of get your input on that because you obviously work for one of the major manufacturers mm -hmm. of machines for a certain... Uh, does Bernina have commercial machines or is it all... Um, we don't ha we have uh, n not any machines that would be called that would be designated as a okay. commercial machine. Yeah, so our machines are all considered home sewing machines. Um, however, mm -hmm. what we would call light industry, a lot of customers mm -hmm. who do light industry, um, so businesses out of their homes, a lot of customers do use our machines, uh, use Bernina's for uh, for that sort of light industry. Um, basically, if you're not running a mattress factory out of your house, you know, you, right, can, right. you can do it. So. Well, I, I want to ask you, though, because you have obviously some insight into this because you talk to a lot of people. Why do you think that there that certain people seem to feel that there needs to be this, you know, we're all kind of doing the same thing. So why do some people seem to either feel negatively about a certain segment or seem to feel that there has to be a divide at all? Do you have any any insight into that or thoughts in, about that? Um, you know, it's, there are lots of divides in the sewing community. There's divides yeah. between kind of the commercial and the, and the home sewing side. There's um, to people who feel like it's a craft versus an art, you know, and there's a lot of those sorts of things. But what I find is most of the time in the end, 
the the large majority of people want to be a community together you know right. so there are there are there are fractures here and there um but in terms of the difference between you know a commercial soist and a home soist um i do think that there are um there are people and especially in our uh industry um who kind of are like why would you um why would you spend all that time sewing when it's just for fun right why wouldn't you want to uh to actually mm. you know have a business it it seems um frivolous maybe uh to them but <laughs> but i think you know we've seen so much evidence that having a hobby and having um time for that is so important and um you know sewing is a great hobby um and i hear people say a lot sewing is my therapy i wouldn't quite go that far because i don't think you can replace good therapy um but right. i <laughs> But I do think it is therapeutic uh, for a mm -hmm. lot of people. I think that is. Um, but there are, um, you know, a lot of people who want to have um, small businesses at home. And um, and there's certainly that opportunity exists as well. Um, so I think there's always going to be differences of opinions and and uh, and divides. And, you know, there are. Uh, but really, I found that the sewing community is really so open for the most part that um, they really want to welcome everybody in. So, well, I also want to talk a little bit because we're we're getting a little low on time. And this goes fast always. <laughs> um, but I want to talk a little bit about the side of this that is art, because I mm -hmm. think that's the part that we don't talk about mm -hmm. enough. We kind of look at, well, you're putting stuff on clothes or you're embroidering a, blank, a quilt or a blanket or whatever. And we kind of tend to dismiss it as, well, that's utilitarian, mm -hmm. you know? And I think there's something to be said for a lot of the people who are maybe wasting their money on mm -hmm. embroidery are doing it because for them, it's artistic yeah. expression. Yes, yes, absolutely. So I guess I want to, that's the first part of this question that I want to, is it artistic for you or is it, is it fun or is it a combo platter or <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm always curious why people do things. Yeah, absolutely. Well, for me, I would say it's definitely a combo platter, right? Um, I, some of what I sew is, is utilitarian. I'm going to wear it. I'm going to use it. I make a lot of quilts for gifts that I wouldn't really consider art. Um, but they have a, um, creative element to mm -hmm. them, you know, and that I was choosing colors and doing some things like that. But I do have some projects that I've worked on in the past um, where I do feel like there's that artistic element to it. Um, and, you know, that line between um, craft and art is is a, a continuum, mm -hmm. right? I don't see it as like it's either craft or it's art. There's a there's a range in between those things, and um, and I think you know we're of course welcome all of the above. Um, however, I will say there are really some fantastic fiber artists out there who are mm -hmm. what we would truly call a fine artist. Um, you know, one that comes to mind, um, she had an exhibit here last year in, at the Chicago uh, Art Institute is Bisa Butler. And I don't know if you've seen her work, but it is amazing. And it, she is truly a fine artist, you know, with um, her art hangs in um, museums. She's got a Smithsonian project. Oh, wow. um, and, you know, they're really, they are works of art, but they're all done um, on a quilting machine. And so, you know, you certainly can take the skills um, that are from the crafting skills and apply them to fine art um, if that's, uh, if that's your bent, if that's what you're into. So. I love that. And I have some, a few comments I want to get to here. Um, Lisa says, yes, that relationship in person is quite valuable talking about the dealer network mm -hmm. and having a dealer in your town that you can go see. Um, Karenna said, I think people don't take embroiderers seriously. If we work at home, the customers feel that they can negotiate what they will pay. And I have to say, piggybacking a little bit on what Karenna said, that is part of the kind of loggerheads that the yeah. commercial people and the people who work from home get to yeah. is sometimes the home sewists have less overhead right so maybe their pricing is a little different and that causes some issues but you know they're working in different kind of different venues too though yeah. i mean you know yeah. i think 
personally, and this is just me from watching the industry as long as I've been here, I think personally that a great market for people working from home can be doing the one-offs and the smaller custom jobs that the commercial guys don't really want to take. Exactly. Exactly. There, you know, that's my theory anyway. Yeah, there absolutely is a strong uh, place for a home-based business. And whether that's, you know, those custom embroideries, those custom monograms, those things, like you said, that a a larger shop uh, Mm -hmm. doesn't want to handle. Um, But I'm a big supporter of people running a business from their home, you know, Speaking specifically about women um, being empowered, you know, they don't always, um, or there are many cases where a woman may not have the flexibility to work any place right. other than home. And that might be the option that's available to her, whether it's because of child care or even elder care purposes, she needs to be at home. And having the ability to run a business from home is is so important. But I, I do understand uh, what Karina is talking about there, that sometimes people assume, well, you're doing it from home. It's really just a hobby for you, right? So right. you you, you don't mind hemming my pants for me, right? Because it's, you know, right? <laughs> so the so, kiss of death. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, it's $5, right, to hem my pants? And it's right. like, no. Um, so you do have to charge what you're worth, and you have to be willing to say no to those jobs where um, where somebody's not willing to pay you enough. Um, because your work is valuable, whether you did it from home or whether you did it in an office. Um, uh-huh. You know, it's, Thank you know. You. <laughs> well, that's a message that I... I put out a lot because I think there is this attitude that, I mean, I work from home. Mm -hmm. I don't, granted, I'm not embroidering, but you know, what I do, I do sometimes from my couch in yoga pants. Right. (laughs) That doesn't make them any less valuable. Right. And, you know, and and it doesn't matter whether you have, you know, a six head Baradin or, Mm -hmm you know, a Bernina whole, I don't know what the Bernina models are. I'm sorry. (laughs) You know, it doesn't matter what you have or how you accomplish what you're doing. If you do Uh good work, you should get paid for it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I want to talk, touch on this just for a minute because um, it happens a lot in our industry, not just for people who are sewing for others, um, but also for designers and people who are influencers and um, and that sort of thing. Um, we tend to give our work away. You know, we tend mm. to undervalue ourselves and, you know, say, oh, I'll, I'll do that for exposure or I'll do that, you know, and, yeah. and you always need to make sure that in all those relationships, there's some benefit to you as well. Um, so oh, I think it's really love important. It. Love it. I'm, te- I'm actually teaching a class at um, Applique Getaway in July on exposure and barter and how to know when it's a good deal and when it isn't mm-hmm. because of that very thing. And as a writer, I can't tell you the number of times I've been hit up with, can you just write this 500 word thing for me? And it'll just, you know, it'll get your name out there. Right. Dude, I've been writing since 2006 for people in this industry. My name is out there. Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) So I would like a check with my name on it and then you (laughs) can have the article. But we have more good comments here. So I want to just throw a couple of these out here. Um, Cindy says, anything you sew is always a piece of art. My artwork it can be a dress, a pair of jeans, or a more crafty project, blankets, and purses. And I have to say, Cindy made a gorgeous purse for me with my monogram on it. And it is a total work of art, and I love it. And so I totally agree with her. Yeah. And Lisa says, someone like Kayla Kennington is, now you guys are giving me all these names that I have to look up, is a wonderful garment artist. And Melanie says in regards to pricing, just add a zero. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) I love it. I love it that you brought that up because I think that is a struggle for a lot of people. There's, There's still this theory that legitimacy in a business is you have a brick and mortar with a sign over the door and a little bell that tinkles when people walk into the shop. And it's like, legitimacy nowadays especially with the internet and the ability that we have to do the things that we do is simply being good at what you do Mm -hmm. you know yeah Yeah. but i think it's a tough thing especially for people who are kind of trying to span a i guess the only way i can think of to say it is they're trying to span a gap a little bit Mm -hmm. you know and i mean I also think that this is an evolving thing because if somebody bought a Bernina maybe 20 years ago, would they have been as likely 
to be thinking about starting a business as maybe they would now? Maybe a different kind of business, you know, okay. um, you know, there's, uh, you don't see as many, for example, home-based tailors, but you see right. a lot more home-based embroiderers um, than in the past. Um, but I will say anybody out there who's thinking about being a tailor, there's lots of business to be had. Um, there's <laughs> lots of, so if you want to learn sew garments uh, you and you want to make a business out of it, there's, there's business out there. Um, but, you know, the technology has changed. And so people are leaning more towards, um, you know, having that embroidery-based business because it's the, the technology is available to us to make it happen. Right. Well, and I want to, we're, we're getting really close to our hour here. And I, but I want to ask you this because this is something that I have heard from some people and I want to see what you think about it, which is that we've gone too far away from people learning the basic skills. Like, you know, there used to be home at class. I mean, I don't even know that home at class was around when I was in school and I graduated in 87, but you know, there used to be, you got taught that stuff. You got taught how to sew and you got taught how to cut a pattern and do all that stuff. And now, so do you think that's just more migrated online or is it totally gone? You know, actually a lot more schools have a home ec program than you'd think. I've been doing really? some research about this actually. And um, there are actually about 5 million students a year going through a home ec class in the United really? States. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so they're well, actually... Yeah, there is a lot of home ec out there. The difference, though, I think, and that's where the perception comes in, is it used to be that these were a required class. Everybody had to take, right. you know, um, had to take home ec. Um, actually, usually the girls had to take home ec and the boys had to take shop. And that's a whole nother discussion for another day. But, um, yeah. you know, <laughs> but it used to be a required thing. And now it's not required. It's an option. It's an elective. Um, but both of my sons took home ec classes and, you know, learned to sew in school. So it's out there. And I think what it takes is us encouraging our kids to take those classes. You know, hey, did you know there's this class available to you? You should take it. You should try it, you know, and, and encouraging kids to, to do it because those skills are so important. Learning how to sew is so important. And it's not just for self-sufficiency, which is important, of course. You know, everybody needs to right. know how to sew, sew on a button and, um, you know, learning you to help. Right. It's it's important. And learning to hem your pants is an excellent skill to have. It certainly will contribute to your life. But also it just opens doors um, to be able to have that exposure uh, to those kinds of, of arts. Um, and I think the same holds true for cooking classes in school and these mm -hmm. sorts of things. You know, these, um, uh, you know, what we would call softer uh, skills mm -hmm. that that aren't all um, math and uh, engineering. I have nothing against math and engineering. My my husband's an engineering instructor, so no, you know, all the love there. Um, but I think that these these softer skills, these home economic skills, are really important. I'm, I'm reading another book. Um, it's all about uh, home economics. So I'll have to send you over the link to it. I can't think of the oh, exact title ooh, of it please. right now. Um, but the it's the whole concept of, you know, because there's still people majoring in home economics in, in college. Um, so it's it's still there. It's just kind of gotten flown under the radar. Well, I love when you said both your sons took home ec. I think that's great because I think that's one of the things that I've always found so weird is, you know, like the boys took shop and the, which happened back in my day too. Mm -hmm. Like I'm a million years old, but you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, the boys took shop and, the, and it wasn't even really an option that if the girls wanted to learn how to, you know, change a carburetor, or I don't know, do you change mm -hmm. carburetors? I obviously know nothing <laughs> about that, but you know, if they wanted to learn how to weld something or build a mm -hmm. birdhouse or whatever, that wasn't something that you were really expected to do. Mm -hmm. And if, a, if the boys wanted to learn how to cook or how to sew or whatever, and I think that's right. It's, it's just a functional skill of being a, a fully actualized, actualized that adult mm -hmm. is, you know, I can sew on a button. I can cook a decent meal. It doesn't have to be fancy, but I can cook something. Right. You know, the you basics. Know? And I remember, well, I remember when I went to college, people who didn't know how to do laundry and that just floored me that they had not, they didn't know how to cook. They didn't know how to do laundry. They didn't know, you know, they're, they're, they'd never learned any of this stuff. And I was just like, how are you going to have, are you just going to hire people to do all this stuff? for you? Your whole life? I don't know. It's just yeah. weird to me. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, 
But I, I love this conversation. I have had so much fun. And oh, one more thing. Cindy says, it is never too late to learn to sew. I have been sewing since I was nine years old. 4-H is a great source. And I would say, I learned what sewing I know, which granted is not a lot. I learned mine from Girl Scouts. Mm -hmm. So same theory that they, you know, they, I learned how to sew on a button. I learned how to do a hem. I'm not great at it, but I can yeah. do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I did some sewing in Girl Scouts too. I'm a, uh, also was a Girl Scout. So uh, shout out to all the Girl Scouts out Yay. there. Um, oh, Girl and, Scouts is a great organization. Yeah, absolutely. And to the 4-Hers too, it's also a great mm -hmm. organization. Um, but yeah, it's a great skill. Sewing is an excellent skill for anybody to have. And, um, you know, if, if, uh, if you never learned how, uh, it's not, it's not too late. It's not too late. Never too late to learn. <laughs> You guys are going to get me into this one. I, <laughs> ugh, boy, this is bad. All right. Well, before we go, I just want to say, please make sure that you go to Bernina.com and check out all the great educational programs. I've been there. There's like pages and pages of stuff for you all to learn and see and do. And oh, it's, it's so great. And I want to pop in here one more time. Ah, Cindy's just my commenter today. Thank you for another great show. I love that. I love that. And all my stuff is popping up here and getting <laughs> in my way. There we go. Thank you so much, Christy. This was so much fun. I loved this conversation. And I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. And thank you, everybody who came and commented and said all the great things that you said. I will be back next week at 3 p.m. My guest will be Ashley Coletti, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Thank you, everybody, so much. Thank you, Christy, so much. And I'm going to hit end broadcast before I just rave about how much fun this is for another 10 minutes. So, oh, thank you, Christy. Bye, everybody.